Good evening, everybody. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to, uh, to be here and to see so many of you here uh, to listen to, to John Gray. I'm, I'm Richard Reeves. I'm the director of the think tank Demos. Uh, and my role uh, this evening is to facilitate what I feel sure will be an engaging debate. And uh, I can tell you I've been looking, looking forward to this uh, since it was first mentioned. I've known John's work for, for many years. And whilst he and I do not agree on everything um, as liberals, or kind of liberals, you wouldn't expect anything less. Um, but nonetheless, we can be assured of an interesting evening. Um, I, I just say heard the first point of interest. We need to swap seats. Do we? Yes, that's Why? not because we've changed our political Why? views in the last five minutes. <laughs> right. Uh, I know I'm often accused of changing, but not that often. Okay. <laughs> Do we know why we had to stop? Uh, for the podcast. Excellent. Okay. I just discovered my place. Um, uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, I uh, am very excited to be here is that John is also doing some work with Demos. He's uh, one of the advisors to a project Demos are running on progressive conservatism. Uh, the Progressive Conservative Project, and I think it uh, speaks greatly to John's honesty and wit that when I asked him if he was willing to advise this project on progressive conservatism, he said he was willing so long as we didn't mind the fact that he was neither a progressive nor a conservative. Uh, and I said, that's exactly the kind of person that we, that we wanted uh, on, the, uh, on the panel. Um, John uh, and I share an interest in John Stuart Mill. Uh, uh, we will try I will try to uh, prevent my interest in John Stuart Mill and liberalism generally to end up dominating the evening too much. Um, but actually, as a critic of liberalism, uh, a friendly critic, um, an engaged critic, I think John has always added kind of huge value. And I think particularly he, he uh, has zeroed in on the weak spot uh, of liberal thought uh, more generally, which is its, uh, its enduring belief in the perfectibility of human nature and that with the kind of right system, the right design, that actually we really can become better people. There's a lovely quote from uh, Tibor Mackin about Marx, uh, which is um, that utopians like Marx uh, are unable to accept the fact that people will make a botch of their lives without there being some metaphysical explanation and therefore revolutionary remedy. And I think that that is a great weakness, not only in Mill's thought, but kind of liberalism generally. And it's why John has been such a good and thoughtful critic of the idea of progress, of which I'm sure we'll hear shortly, which is that this kind of the Enlightenment view that more knowledge and progress will, will make for a better society and it will make us better people despite the historical evidence that we resolutely refuse to get very much better over the course of time. Um, he has been compared to John Stuart Mill. He was compared thus in a New Statesman uh, profile of John recently. Um, what I think um, uh, John certainly shares with Mill is a couple of points. One, a uh, kind of instinctive liberalism, I think, although that liberalism's obviously undergone changes during John's career, um, that uh, he shares with Mill a suspicion of systemic thinkers, and anybody who claims to have created the system that will explain everything. Um, and I also think uh, a shared uh, concern for those who would be described as mere thinkers. Uh, and Mill was critical of those who strutted and fretted their hour on the stage. Um, without engaging with the issues of the day. And I think it, that is definitely something that uh, John would share. Uh, I'm sure many of you know John's work from before. Um, this latest book, Grey's Anatomy, is on sale outside. Uh, it has been discounted, unaccountably discounted by four pounds um, for those of you who are here. And John will be signing them afterwards. I'll say that now before I forget. Um, it demonstrates once again that uh, John Gray, who's now of course, Professor Emeritus of European Thought here at the LSE, is one of our most interesting public intellectuals. I mean that in the best sense, John. I'm not sure that's a label you want me to attach to you. Um, but what I mean by that is someone who remains engaged with the issues of the day, who remains open, who remains curious, uh, who is always uh, provocative and engaging, generous in argument. Um, and all of that is a long way of saying, I'm very much looking forward to this. And over to you, John. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I'm glad you mentioned Mill because I spent um, several decades of my life reading Mill in general with profit and interest, uh, not terribly often with amusement. Um, I think only once did I ever discover anything in Mill that could be liberally described as a joke. And that's in his autobiography where he says of his father, James Mill, he said, my father believed that of a whole series of very improbable reforms were implemented, human life would become worth living, semicolon. But he never displayed any enthusiasm at the prospect. 
Now, my view is slightly different. Mill, of course, was, I think, one of the most robust and um, uh, reflective defenders of uh, the idea of progress. Unlike many people now, I think, he thought quite deeply about what progress meant. Um, and he had a theory of it. He had a definite conception of it, which he defended in, uh, throughout his writings. And I think it's still the basic um, conception of progress which is around today, but it's not self-critically examined and exposed to public uh, inspection in the way that Mill examined it and exposed it to public inspection. And I'll try and summarize it. Richard is a, uh, a very uh, knowledgeable and profound Mill scholar. He can um, tell me later if he thinks this is a good gloss, but basically what Mill thought progress was, was this. Mill thought that human knowledge has an inbuilt, inbuilt tendency to be cumulative. That's to say that knowledge grows. Once we've got knowledge, um, uh, human practice, and later on, organized institutions of scientific inquiry extend and develop the knowledge in such a way that what has been gained is not lost. So what's progressive about human knowledge is precisely in this. It's not inevitable that knowledge would continue growing. Humans could vanish from the planet. There could be a catastrophic ecological catastrophe which would wipe out scientific laboratories everywhere. But over time, over human history, emerging from prehistory, the acceleration of knowledge, the growth and acceleration of knowledge has acquired an almost irresistible momentum. Once it gets going, once it uh, 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 is embodied in institutions in various parts of the world, even a very large catastrophe would not stop the growth of knowledge or its further accumulation. So that now, for example, even if, God forbid, um, uh, most of the scientific laboratories in the world vanished, even if there was some cataclysmic ecological catastrophe, human knowledge would not disappear. Not only would it not disappear, I think it would continue to accelerate. The momentum for further, even more rapid, extensive growth of knowledge is by now all but irresistible. Now Mill thought, and pretty well all contemporary thinkers think today, whether they be liberals, politically conservatives, social democrats, Marxians, neo-Marxians, or Greens, they think that, as he did, that ethical and political practice, ethical and political life can replicate the cumulative advance that has occurred in science. That's to say, they think that just as in science we build on previous theories, the previous theory isn't completely junked. Most of it actually stays true. Most of Newtonian physics, or a lot of it still is, 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 is sound when we then move to Einsteinian physics. We carry on with what has been achieved or discovered in a scientific theory and get better theories. And here's an important point, by the way. I'm not a relativist or a postmodernist, in my view, of scientific knowledge any more than Mill was. My disagreement with Mill is different, a different, entirely different area. The growth of knowledge is just a fact. The number of human beings in the world is a spin-off from the growth of knowledge and the application of knowledge in fields like medicine and agriculture public health, the theory of germs, and so on and so forth. If human knowledge hadn't grown in the way it has, there wouldn't be as many humans in the world, and humans wouldn't have as much power as they have over the natural environment and each other. So I regard the postmodernist view, or a relativist view, which says science is simply one more belief system like magic. I think I don't take it seriously. I don't even dis discuss it. I don't even debate it. Um, any more than I debate with fundamentalists. It's not worth debating, it's just a silly view. Um, so to that extent, I agree with Mill. There is, uh, human knowledge is cumulative. It now has an irresistible momentum. It will go on developing and even accelerating under almost any circumstances. But where I differ from Mill, and this is in a way the crucial feature of what I've tried to argue over the, in the articles and um, uh, in, this, in this collection of my essays from the last 30 years or so, and I'll try in a moment to relate what I'm saying directly to the global situation and to, and to politics now. But what I want to argue is that in ethics and politics, there is no cumulative, irreversible advance of the kind there is in the growth of knowledge. What is gained politically 
can always be lost and normally is over time. So that there is a kind of background idea, I think, which many of us have without really kind of thinking about it, which is of ethical and political advance as being kind of like in a kind of stepwise. So you get democracy or you abolish slavery. Uh, then having achieved that, they're supposed to be stable, these achievements. You go on from that to have anti-discrimination uh, legislation. You move on to yet further things. You raise living standards even further. It's an idea that once you've achieved certain um, ethical goals, they're there. You can take them for granted. You can move on to other things. So they're like, if you like, scientific theories. Once the scientific theory has been developed, even if you correct it and replace it by another one later on, most of it remains, uh, remains there. Now, my view is ethics and politics aren't like that. That all the achievements, which again, I'm not an ethical skeptic, I'm not one who believes that human values fluctuate according to culture. I don't believe that it's a rather rewarding experience to be tortured so long as you're tortured by someone in your own community. I don't believe um, uh, you experience rape differently because it's very common where you are. It's as horrible as it would be uh, anywhere else. There are some um, universal human values and therefore there are some universal gains. But those gains can and normally do vanish in an eye when uh, society faces a major threat. Uh, long periods, even a generation or two of advance, can be uh, um, wiped out and frequently has been when circumstances change. Let me give you an example. The abolition of slavery in the United States and the Caribbean and elsewhere was a great advance. Um, it may have had uh, various limitations. It didn't go, wasn't quick enough, didn't go far enough, but it was basically a great advance. Does that mean that slavery vanished? Well, in the 20th century, as often happens, the evil of slavery came back under a different name. There was what was called socialist construction in the Stalinist gulag. They were slaves. Um, they perished in large numbers. Um, uh, um, the Nazis brought slavery back pretty explicitly. And now we've brought back various types of quasi-slavery, human trafficking, um, bonded labor in uh, the Gulf and elsewhere. These are surrogates or things like slavery, but we call them something different. Just as torture was called enhanced interrogation, enhanced ter interrogation techniques. And these things happen quickly, normally. You certainly did with torture. I suppose the development of, 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 of crypto-slavery or the new forms of slavery in the 20th century developed over a period of time. But because they were called something different, and in the case of the former Soviet Union, associated with a progressive political project, they weren't recognized at the time by very many people for being what they were, namely a reinvention of slavery. It colossal, vast human cost, vast loss of life, and apart from all the lives that were lost, probably 15 or 20 million, and that's not counting any of the lives lost as a consequence of the Nazi invasion, which was probably another 18 million. Um, apart from all those lives that were actually consumed, destroyed, um, for example, in the Kolyma camps, the average lifespan was about three years. It couldn't easily survive more than three years. Apart from there were all the lives that were broken beyond repair, the human relationships that were destroyed, the lives that were shortened or cut or disrupted. And I'm afraid to say that one of the features of the 20th century is that um, uh, that vast uh, uh, horror was not criticized, not attacked, uh, in my view, uh, as much as it should have been, because it was associated with a progressive political project. Now, there were people who attacked it. There were social democrats, liberals, conservatives, some Trotskyists, Marxists, and others who did attack it. But on the whole, I think it wasn't attacked as much as it should have done. And in the case of Nazism, a much more explicitly um, uh, project of annihilation and enslavement and genocide it did let us remember, it did really, uh, we were almost went to the very brink with respect to Nazism in this country, supposing Winston Churchill hadn't been around when he was. I'm not a universal admirer of Churchill, though I do admire him immensely as a war leader. He was wrong about almost everything else, but let's put that aside. Um, uh, supposing he hadn't been around, Supposing his habit of uh, two or three brandies before breakfast had softened his uh, brain, which it doesn't seem to have done at all. Supposing he hadn't got the 
uh, position that he did get in 1940, supposing we'd had a shameful compromise peace brokered by people like Halifax, supported at that time by most of the Labour Party, the whole of the city, the royal family, etc. What would have been the situation in the world? Those horrors, as it were, were not perceived in their full um, uh, qualities, um, really, until after the war, and perhaps even to this day, they're not um, fully perceived. So what I'm arguing is this, and it's a sort of very subversive thought in some ways, and one that is hard to tolerate. People often say, well, if I believe what you did, John, I wouldn't get up in the morning, to which I replied, stay in bed a little longer. Uh, think about why you need to get up, as it were. My ar argument is this, progress, cumulative advance, to the point at which it becomes almost irreversible, is a fact in human knowledge, but human beings remain much the same. Their motives, their impulses, their contradictions, our contradictions, our needs, conflict in much the same ways, and we remain prone to the, chief, to, the, to the classical forms of human folly and cruelty. Let me now, as I said I would, just briefly try to make this less abstract by talking about the present situation uh, uh, with respect particularly to the global financial crisis. Now, the first thing to think about this is not so much that very few people predicted it. It's more that it was not supposed to happen. Think back a year, two years. How many people were there who said we could have a rerun of mass unemployment? How many people were there who said um, uh, this global credit boom, bigger than any in history before, could come to a rather bad end? Indeed, it will come to a rather bad end because it's, it's essentially unsustainable. How many were there? Um, how many were, uh, people were there who said, well, maybe we should build into our institutions uh, safeguards, fail-safes, so that when this comes to an end, as it undoubtedly will, we won't suffer a major crash. Now, all that thinking, as it were, that type of precautionary thinking, people were talking about it in, in green circles, but in economic policy, almost no one talked that way. Indeed, think back in 1999, uh, in America, Lawrence Summers and others repealed, helped, were pivotal in repealing the Glass-Steagall Act, which maybe some of you may know about. The Glass-Steagall Act was a Roosevelt-era act uh, brought about in the Great Depression, which prevented um, investment banking and, all, and ordinary retail banking being merged. It stopped the banks from becoming hedge funds. That was repealed in 1999. Why was it repealed in 1999? Well, maybe I can go back, as it were, to 1989, when, the, when communism fell or began to fall. The Soviet regime, actually, Soviet state only ceased to exist a couple of years later, but the wall went down and it was obviously all over. In one of the pieces which I have in here, a piece from October 1989, I, I criticize Francis Fukuyama, a long series of entirely unproductive and fruitless criticisms, I may say, because he's never changed his views at all. He might say the same of me. But basically what I said at that time is, um, this is a great triumph for freedom in the 70s and 80s. I was an active anti-communist. I don't regret that for one moment. It was a terrible system. I was glad it went down. But when it went down, we're in a different situation. We're in a situation in which lots of conflicts which have been frozen or latent will become real. Lots of conflicts which have been suppressed will burst out. Classical old evils of ethnic nationalism, conflicts between religions, persecution of internal and external minorities, conflicts over water and hydrocarbons, all of those which had gone on in some kind of way, even during the Cold War, will be much more naked, much less repressed, and more intense. And that's what I said in 1989, in October 1989, so did some other people. So, by the way, did the first George Bush, well, not the very first, but George Bush Sr. Actually, when the wall went down, George Bush Sr., who, uh, when compared with his son, really does sound somewhat like John Stuart Mill, um, said, this is no moment for triumph. George Bush Sr., this is no moment for triumph. We're glad it's happened, but it's going to be immense, difficult, intractable problems. I agreed with that. Obviously, no one listened um, to him. Um, and what people said was kind of rather interesting. What they said was, 
that what people like Bush and a few others and I were saying, they said that was apocalyptic. Well, apocalyptic means, we were saying things like, well, there will be wars, you know, there will be conflicts, there will be ethnic nationalism, there will be uh, all kinds of nasty uh, um, human interactions will follow this, this, this big collapse. Oh, that's apocalyptic. Well, apocalyptic means, in biblical terms, it means an unveiling of, of, of mysteries, but normally it means the end of history. What we were saying was history would go on. In other words, if you said history would go on, you're apocalyptic. If you said it had stopped, you were a realist. If you said that from now on, basically, the major conflicts of history wouldn't trouble us. There wouldn't be pogroms. There wouldn't be um, mass murder. There wouldn't be genocide. There wouldn't be conflicts over water. There wouldn't be conflicts over natural resources. None of these things would happen again because we're in a new era. You are fated as a realist. If you said all these things will happen again, you are considered to be apocalyptic. And I was reminded at the time, by the way, I should say that in the late 1980s, there was a saying circulating in Eastern Europe when it was still communism, and the saying was, don't expect too much from the end of the world. That's exactly what happened in 1989 when a certain type of world did end. What ended then was just a particular imperial system, a particular semi-totalitarian by their then decayed system, which interestingly, by the way, and I think this may be almost unique, I say that, I know that's oxymoronic, but I can't think of another example in history, it ended without significant violence or war to begin with. The whole thing just melted away, vanished away, and I think the reason was that even the ruling elites didn't have the um, strength or the will to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, um, defend it. And what happened then, I think, in the 90s was, an, and, and really almost up to the present time, was an era of delusion and of self-delusion. It was the idea that now that communism had gone, we had the makings of a universal system, a global free market, which once it had been set up, could work semi-automatically. What in fact did happen was the growth of a type of market globalization that no one understood, I don't think it's true that the people who benefited from it for a while really understood it. I think the head of Lehman's, three or four months before Lehman's collapsed, was offered 40 million in bonus and given a choice as to whether he wanted it in uh, cash or shares. He took it 100% in shares. They vanished a few months later to nothing. I don't think the people who I don't have the kind of primitive view that these wicked financiers were simply raking in the profits and knowing what they were doing. They were raking in the profits without knowing what they were doing. Now that it's, it's gone up in smoke. But the key thing, therefore, to understand now, and this is where I come sort of back to the practical relevance of my skepticism about progress, is that this is not a crisis which can, in fact, be fully managed. It's not, in fact, a crisis that can, in fact, be fully solved. Um, where I think in the first stage of a sort of large-scale unraveling, which will have various um, uh, aspects. One is that the process of deleveraging in the economy itself, which is that things falling back to more realistic prices, has got a lot further to go. But it might not go all that further, because all over the world, or at least in America and Britain and some other countries, maybe China, the threat that this crisis has posed is now posing to employment to employment, to jobs, to the actual real economies, is evoking countermeasures, quantitative easing, various types of Keynesian money creation and so on, whose ultimate effect, as well as its goal, is to, in a sense, resolve the debt crisis by cheapening the debts, devaluing the jets, and engineering inflation. And I think one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, first of all, is it possible to engineer this inflation? Um, I think it definitely is, but I'm not sure it's been achieved yet because the uh, depressionary forces, are, uh, the destruction of wealth and demand is absolutely vast and still ongoing. Um, but is it possible? Yes, because you can create money now electronically. You don't even need to print it. You create it out of nothing, ex nihilo. But what will be the effect of that? I think Keynes would have understood this, actually, by the way. Maybe you can get out of the debt crisis by money creation, but you actually can't stabilize the system because the system was unsustainable before, it's tilted now into a period of radical implosion. You can avoid maybe, a, you can certainly avoid, I think, a rerun of the 30s. First of all, there's no Nazism. 
thank God. There's no communism, there aren't these mass movements. There are other mass movements, but not those. And also, the central banks have immediately reacted by um, money creation. So I don't think we're going to have, I might be wrong about this if I come back in two or three years, I don't think we're going to have a long period of deep deflation. I don't think that's going to happen. Because if the present money creation isn't enough, it'll be cranked up more. So that eventually... Um, what would a long period of deflation mean in a country like Britain where practically no one has any assets and everyone's in debt? It would be completely crushing. So it's not going to happen. That's among the evils we needn't bother about. Uh, well, maybe we should bother about it, but it's not, not actually going to happen. But what will happen? And here again, I have to sort of reinforce my um, reputation as a pessimist because what I fear now is that as this crisis moves into the real economy, in various countries, as you get sudden steep rises of unemployment, as you get sudden acute hardship uh, in various parts of the world, all the classical poisons and pathologies of politics will come back out again. Uh, persecution of internal and external minorities, anti-Semitism in parts of uh, Europe and elsewhere in the world, uh, ethnic and other types of religious conflict, all these poisons which, as it were, are somewhat never removed, but which are somewhat um, neutralized by um, affluence, will come out. So you could say, well, you know, if you think that, what can be done? Well, I actually think that things can be done. I mean, we could even have done certain things about the um, economic uh, and financial crisis. For example, because you could say this is hindsight, except that there were people advocating it at the time, but people a year or so ago didn't listen to them, it would have been better to go for a wholesale nationalization of the banking system and to hive off the hedge funds. Not to, I'm, I'm not one of those who think that hedge funds should be banned or even excessively regulated, but what certainly should be done is that it should be made clear that there's a difference, as there was under Glass-Steagall and other types of regulation, with the ordinary retail banking system where your money is safe. And if you want to speculate, or some people want to speculate, they can, but it's clear that there will never be a bailout. And if things go wrong, they have, to, they have to pay the price. That would have been better. In other words, it would have been better to nationalize the banking system and enforce some kind of separation between those different functions. Whether it can now be done, I'm not sure, because on both sides of the Atlantic, the policy has been to throw resources into these black holes, some of which may be growing bigger, because the value of real assets in the world, which are heavily leveraged against debt, is going down because economic activity is going down. So I think what we have to do, in a sense, is to prepare ourselves in advance um, for these classical human responses to sudden sharp hardship and unemployment. Not to say that I think there's nothing worse, in a sense, than those people who say, well, we shouldn't think like this because it's gloomy and depressing. Well, I mean, it seems to me to be more gloomy and more depressing just not think about it and then for it to happen. Because it means we haven't prepared for it, and if we do prepare for it, maybe we can, if not prevent it, sometimes we can perhaps prevent some of the worst evils, but we can also, um, even if we can't prevent them, we can mitigate them. We know how to do with them. We have uh, um, uh, ways of coping with them. But if we think they're behind us, to go back to right what I started, if we think that Mill was correct in this respect, He's still a very relevant thinker, to my mind. We can learn a lot from him, actually. Partly because he engaged not only with the academy, uh, but all, uh, not even principally with the academy, but actually with the great movements of his time. Democracy, feminism, socialism, and so on. I think we can learn a lot from him. But where I think he was mistaken was in believing that the growth of knowledge in and of itself, or by some clever set of constitutional and legal devices, which once in place, would um, enable ethics and politics, would enable morality and civilization to show the same type of semi-inexorable cumulative growth that we have in, 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 in science. I think that's just a mistake. And the evidence for it, in a way, is the 20th century. Isaiah Berlin, who was a great influence on me in many ways, I think made a very good remark about Mill. He said, Mill was the least prophetic of writers. Practically everything that happened in the 20th century would have been a surprise to him. He wouldn't have expected the Great World Wars. He would never have expected Nazism. None of those things that could happen. And if you read Mill, you see why, to some extent. He says, we're moving into the period of what he calls social astronomy, 
We can look far into the future and we can see this wonderful, vast, marvelous future. Um, I think that's all nonsense. I think it's much better to look closer to the present and try and cope with that. I think that even though, I'll conclude on this point, because I, I, I think if you wanted to read someone, you could do a lot worse than read Mill now. He came up with, I think, the only attractive utopia I've ever come across. Therefore, the one that's never been attempted and never will be. It was the, the stationary state society. His, his, his utopia was, he didn't think it was a utopia, but I'm afraid it is, uh, is that, it, is that uh, technical progress would continue, but it would be used not in order to expand production <coughs> and consumption. It would be used in order to improve the quality of human life. And I think that's a sort of wonderful idea, as they never been attempted. Maybe something like that is floating around in Obama's America, and I'm glad that it is, but it's coming up against the enormous problem that all over the world, governments are really struggling for fear of social and political upheaval. They're struggling to get the type of growth that collapsed a year or so ago going again. And I think in those circumstances, no matter what they talk about, green energy, green growth, or a green dimension, the key thing is to get the thing going for a while and the green stuff is left till later. But here, and here's my final observation, the planet doesn't really care greatly about what we think. And it's no good sending it notes and saying, can we have another five years? Uh, could you slightly change the figures on carbon? Um, uh, it doesn't, all it cares about is what humans do. And if we do, as it were, get out of this crisis, and we will, by the way, because again, I mean, none of these guys ever terminal. Growth will re resume. The first thing that will happen when growth starts resuming is resource prices will go back up again. We may not go immediately to $100 or $200 oil, but prices will go to inevitably supply and demand. Um, as we do that, there'll be more conflicts over these resources, and we'll also have a higher risk of accelerating ch climate change. So in this kind of circumstance, I think we should basically, I mean, the attitude I'm recommending is um, uh, coping flexibly and intelligently with these dilemmas in the knowledge that they may not be fully soluble. But after all, that's what we all do in our ordinary lives. I mean, we don't say, um, I've just read a book which says that my life expectancy is only 89. I think I'll throw myself out of a window. I mean, we actually um, live uh, meaningfully and, um, and um, happily, I would say, coping with problems that can't be fully solved. The final question I'll put, put to you is this, because I can put this to myself. Is progress a myth that we can't do without progress in ethics and politics? And this, I think, is probably the most sharp and penetrating criticism that I can get. If we, got, if we, if we gave up this belief without having any other religious or other faith, could we actually cope with the problems? I think we could. I hope we could. I don't see why we couldn't. Second World War was not gone into with wild utopian ideas of any kind. It was a grim job that needed to be done. Oddly enough, it was successful. The, the main goals were achieved. Why can't we exhibit a similar capacity for clear thinking and a degree of stoicism now? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, John. I will open to the floor in just a moment, but um, I will just abuse my position for a couple of minutes um, and push uh, John back on a couple of those points, I think. The first actually relates to precisely to the question you set to us at the end, can we, can we do without it? Um, but let's go back a little bit. Your, your definition of mill, of liberalism mm. generally, is absolutely right. Even in the, the stationary state, he said, doesn't mean an end to moral progress. So the view that we would be morally progressive underpins Mill and liberalism. Um, but you yourself have said there are, just now, there are, you've written this as well, there are universal human values. You've mentioned some of those. Um, and I think it is at least plausible to argue that our attitude to some of the things you've mentioned, rape, torture, um, have changed, and that even the way we now look at Nazism, the way we look at, for example, rape within marriage, which Mill campaigned on in the middle of the 19th century, and which finally the law was passed, I think, in 1994. So it took a bit longer than he thought. But nonetheless, you know, so those, those uh, universal human mm. values are, do seem to be more accepted now. And precisely mm. the things you've said about Nazism and rape mm. and torture, mm. safe in the knowledge that you won't really be contradicted, 
uh, in your view of those things, arguably does represent mm. moral progress. Even if we remain, you mm. know, broken and uh, mm. you know human, mm. we can have a different view about human mm. failing. So mm. there are, can be human failings, mm. but we can change how we view those failings. Mm. Isn't that progress? Um, part of it definitely are advance, but I have, uh, in that, to that extent, progress. But I guess I still have a couple of worries. Um, some of Mill's views about what constituted progress seem to us to be extremely ridiculous. I'll give you an example. You're probably aware of it. He said that in the future progress of humankind, conjugation, that's to say sexual life, would occur purely as a matter of duty and not of pleasure. So it would take a long time to achieve this. There would be lots of setbacks. Um, uh, but over time, eventually, you would... And that's because he was a Victorian, of course, because he distinguished sharply between the higher and the lower pleasures, and he assumed that the higher pleasures were intellectual and the lower pleasures were physical. But still, your point remains, don't we have a better grasp of some important issues? Yes, we do. I think we do have a better grasp of important issues. But will we hold on to it? Will we hold on to it? Or will, 100 years from now, will this degree of um, moral clarity have been lost? I mean, if you look back over longer periods of human history, for example, um, uh, there wasn't the homophobia in the ancient world that there now is, or that there has been in Christendom and many parts of Europe over the last, most parts of Europe and of the Christian world over the last um, uh, 17 or 18 or 1900 years, it didn't exist. So that was regress. People created a moral problem or a new sin or a new mm. evil when it didn't exist in the ancient world. So just as you can say that there can be a better grasp of moral reality when we understand that rape within marriage is no different from rape outside of marriage, it's equally bad. Um, so I think there can be um, moral regress. Mm. And so we're back to the issue of, um, uh, of, cumulate, of, 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 of cumulative and near irreversible advance. So I think even in ethics, Knowledge in ethics, learning in ethics, isn't like knowledge in the sciences. Um, it can be lost. Now, I know people will say, well, look, if we get better knowledge of human psychology, et cetera, then mm -hmm. we can. But remember, knowledge of human psychology can be used for very bad yeah. purposes. The Nazis had a brilliant knowledge of crowd psychology. They understood that if you put people in very exciting, have uniforms and loud noises and lots of, mm. uh, um, uh, lots of persecution and cruelty going on in the background, People, many people will enjoy that. They understood that. They understood, if you like, some of the practical consequences of the theory of the unconscious. So there isn't a type of knowledge that can avoid the um, reversibility of moral learning or moral knowledge. I think moral knowledge is extremely fragile. Yeah. More than, more than scientific knowledge. But that's, that's exactly what I was going to ask you next. Is that <laughs> there's a difference there between... I mean, there's a quote about Blair that who was it, he said, um, Blair... Um, trying to get into government was like someone carrying a, a Ming vase across a highly polished floor, you know, kind of aware of the fragility of his pole leading kind of something. And actually there is a distinction between saying that there is nothing inevitable about moral progress, mm. there is nothing innate about the connection mm. between scientific knowledge mm. and moral Mm. Uh, progress, mm. but uh, and saying that there has not been moral progress. So, I, you, as a mm. point of fact, just the same way that it is a mm. fact that scientific mm. knowledge, then mm. the counter argument can be: it is a fact mm. that there has been moral progress mm. in our attitude towards these very things. You're saying, don't assume that because we've achieved it, we don't have to continue to fight, and that it might not be lost. But that's yeah. that, that, it's, that's a yeah. completely different. Argument. You're quite right. We but might lose it, but we, we have we have got something. You're quite right, but the belief in progress is more than the sort of observation. I mean, I, I mean, you haven't done this, but some people, as it were, who disagree with me, they say, well, there is progress. And the behind of this, well, look at me, aren't I progress? <laughs> In other words, uh, you know, human history has been struggling. It's been jolly difficult to produce me, but finally it did. Uh, now, so I actually don't deny that um, there, is, as it were, there are facts, pro but progress is not a fact. Progress is a belief or a faith or a theory, if you like. And what it involves is the idea, it's something like this. Mm -hmm that the changes that are brought in, the genuine improvements, are somehow mutually reinforcing. It's the idea, in other words, mm -hmm. that if you, if, you, if, you, if you get advance in one sphere of human activity, mm -hmm. it will transmit to others. Now, why don't I think that? Well, the present example, is, the present situation is a good example. If there are, in some countries, sudden rapid breakdowns in economic life, if that happens, then many of the things that we've taken as fixed, like 
no pogroms, no murders, mm. no widespread, will suddenly start happening again. Mm. So that the idea that there is a kind of chain connection between these good things, mm. that's mm. the modern faith in progress. So it's not that I deny the obvious fact. I don't think even Aristotle, not that Aristotle can be called kind of any kind of progressive, but uh, one of the dullest thinkers, I think, although a great one that one can really have, but, uh, um, uh, even, but he didn't deny that there are better and worse states of human society, there are, mm. that things can be gained and lost, mm. and that some things have now been gained, and we have a clearer view of what those gains are. But they're not linked together in the way that believers in progress imagine. In other words, some kind of exogenous shock or sudden event or human decision can absolutely wipe them out overnight. Mm. And that, I think, is, is what's missing in the theory of progress. It was certainly missing in Mill, because what Mill thought was, yeah. if you said to Mill, put it exactly that, um, human knowledge could accelerate while ethical and political life deteriorated. I don't think he could imagine that happening for very long. He would think that after, over time, human ethical and political life would be dragged along and would improve. That's what I re reject. Yeah, I, think, I mean, actually, Mill, Mill was going to write an ethology, which was going to be a science of human nature, yeah. which would explain everything about humans and allow us to kind of run societies in a way mm. that were absolutely yeah. based on the same scientific understanding of human nature as we had for everything else. Um, and he never got around to writing that book. Um, and it's quite clear as you go through, the reason he never got around to writing it was because he realised it actually couldn't be written. That we'd never understand human nature in that way. I think you're a bit unfair about his views on uh, uh, conjugation, by the way. But anyway, mm. um, so, so turn to this point about progress as a fact yeah. versus progress as a faith. Because mm. it seems to me I could plausibly argue that actually the point about progress is that it's precious can be reversed and we therefore need to continue mm. to kind of fight for mm. what we've got. Yeah, so I think that's fine. Mm. So it's conditional. Mm. Conditional view of progress is fine. But actually it seems to me your real assault is on the idea it, what it does as a faith, mm. as a kind of view of, yeah. of the world. Yeah. Uh, and then you ask the question of us, is it kind of necessary? Yeah. You, know, you describe it as the myth of yeah. kind of human progress. Um, and there I wonder whether or, not, whether or not that might not be the case as well. Because mm. just in the same way that we you know, we know mm. perhaps that we are difficult to improve. Mm. The view that we can improve ourselves, that we mm. can become better, mm. wiser, fitter, mm. whatever, you know, that we can come mm. to interesting discussions or, you know, mm. make ourselves go for a mm. run or whatever. They're all based on a kind of view that we can make ourselves better, right? Mm. Um, and I think we all know that that's kind of mythical. And we all kind of know that we're kind of kidding ourselves at some level. But it gets us part of the way there, right? So... The astronomy point is kind of right. So I know that you know I'm never going to mm. you know run a triathlon or kind of you know write the book I want to write, or whatever. But but merely thinking that I might one day, mm. convincing, thinking I might, it's, it's a total myth. But uh, may, it means I might get out of bed and slouch around a two-mile run and write the, one book. <laughs> so isn't that so? They take that collectively. Okay, it's that's true. That's where, why, sorry, that's why, where, that's why, where I disagree. Take that collectively. Yeah. You see in. In personal life, in private life, in the lives of associations, we can um, adopt goals um, which we might know consciously or half consciously are not achievable and still find uh, the experience worthwhile and even achieve more than we thought we could. Mm -hmm. But I think politics is different because you're using the, the power of the state, you're taking big decisions about resources and even about war and peace. And there I do not take the view, which is so common, where people say, well, we should strive for the impossible because we'll get closer to a better world by striving for the impossible. Um, one of the reasons I was so, so to speak, adamantly opposed to the Iraq war before the war ever started, a year before, uh, when I became convinced first that it was inevitable by then, wasn't inevitable always, if someone like George Bush Sr. had been in the White House, it might not have happened. But a year before the war um, happened, I thought it was inevitable. And I was completely convinced that it would be catastrophic. And I still have that, despite that view, despite the surge and some recent apparent improvement, is that I thought the goals were impossible of achievement. People would say, wouldn't it be better if you had democracy? Wouldn't it be better if you had this X, Y, Z in, in Iraq? I would say, yes, it would be better if you didn't have this absolutely abominable regime which you've got there, which has done so many terrible things. But the risk of doing what was done was that you shatter the state, parts of it break up, mm. and then the situation of some parts of the population, religious minorities, Christians and others, 
women, gays, uh, uh, is even worse than it was before. And you have a long period of anarchy and loss of life and of terror. And at the end of... No, I didn't mean... An, I, no, I said religious minorities and women. Perhaps you didn't hear yeah, me. Yeah, no, there was an and. There was an and. I didn't. There was an and in between. Um, is worse than they were, uh, is worse than before. So they would, the majority would be worse, and that would apply even if they were um, Shia women who are in the majority of the religious uh, population. And I argued that at the time. And the, 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 I think the general pattern of de public debate actually supported me, but the decision went the other way, as I knew it would. And the decision went the other way because Mr. Blair and others said, tyranny is bad, Tyranny is evil. We can't just sit about letting tyranny go on. We've got to attempt something. Even if it's impossible, the world will be better. Now, that's absolutely the opposite of what happened. If you go around attempting impossible things, not in your private life where uh, it may work, but in terms of decisions of war and peace, revolution or no revolution, uh, large-scale government policies, if you go around attempting the impossible, normally, I would even say, normally, not perhaps always, but normally, the situation is worse than it was before. And sometimes you have great costs. Life is even worse for the people that you're dealing with. Now, to come back to your point, though, Richard, about the myth of progress, it is, a, a, a problem, it is an issue for me. I'm, I'll be honest about this. Because, of course, I don't think a myth-free civilization is possible. I don't think myth can be eliminated from human life. In fact, I think that the idea that myth can be eliminated from human life is a myth. <laughs> it's the myth of rationalism. It's the myth that we can sort of drive the myth-making need from us and can only be rational. And by the way, the people who believe this, that the world could be without myths, are always completely controlled by their own myths. It's just that they think their myths are facts. Um, uh, so it is a problem for me. And if you answer, ask me, is, myth, is, the, is the myth of progress is now a valuable myth or a harmful myth? I think there was a time in human history when it was valuable. For example, um, the campaign against torture was, in Europe was initiated by people like Montesquieu and Voltaire, who, though not without doubt in the case of Voltaire, did subscribe to the myth of progress. Maybe we wouldn't have had that advance if people hadn't had that myth. So I'm not saying it's always harmful. I'm not even saying it might not be necessary at times. But I think it's become harmful and it's become dangerous. Because and the reason it's become harmful and become dangerous is, in a sense, a result of the progress we've had over the last few generations. The world population is rich. Parts of the world population are richer than they were, not only in the wealthy countries, but also in China and India and elsewhere. There's been progress. So the idea that there could be a big setback the idea that um, this wealth could suddenly evaporate in war or revolution or chaos. That idea is so off the wall, it's not even frightening enough, until it seems so off the wall that no one would consider it seriously. But it's entirely possible. That's kind of one example. Similarly, if you say there could be a re-emergence, it's already happened actually in some parts of Europe, on a small scale, of the old far right. Mm. People used to ask me, what will happen after the new right, John? I would say, it'll be the old right. That's what will happen. After the new right, you get the old right. Mm. That's to say, you get the old, classical, nationalist, bigoted right comes back. Two years ago, when I used to say this, people thought I was crazy. Um, because they thought that the growth would go on, that affluence would work its benign magic, and that all these horrible things would go away. As I think a famous economist said, I forget which one, he said, well, if you put people on a lovely beach, give them a cocktail uh, and uh, good incomes and expectation of a good pension, and uh, you won't have any fanaticism anymore. People will become, they'll settle into a kind of bland tranquility. But there are two problems with that. First of all, it's very difficult to maintain the whole world in a stage of, state of continuous, <laughs> steady economic growth forever. Capitalism is an unruly beast. It may be the best system we have in its different varieties, but it's very unruly and has built in uh, anarchical tendencies. So these kinds of events are not that surprising. I don't think Marx would have been surprised. But secondly, it's not even true that very affluent people become so much better. Is it really true that um, the poorest people in the world are the most bigoted? I'm not sure that's true. Is it true that with, with, with wealth, 
uh, um, um, tolerance and compassion and sympathy grow greater. I'm not sure that's, sure that's true either. So I think all these, all these um, kind of ideas uh, of um, uh, the kind of cross-linkage of different forms of gain or good in human society reinforcing each other, they may have had some benign um, impact and use uh, and value and function in the past. But I think now they're more dangerous because they, um, they, they uh, um, make us more myopic about the threats we face and make us continually surprised at the sudden return of old evils when I think we shouldn't be that surprised. <clears throat> okay, last one from me then. Does, does that mean then that the myth of progress might still be valuable in some parts of the world but not others? So you take an example of using the state as an enterprise association mm. which you'd oppose, such as the impossible idea of gender equality, which mm. are, you know, still work to be done, but when 19th century liberals like Judge mm. Mill argued for gender, total legal, social, political mm. and economic gender equality was mm. you know, basically derided as a whack job mm. um, and lost his parliamentary seat as part of the result because he was li li mm. almost no one agreed with him. But the result of that, he mm. got 74 votes, Millicent Fawcett mm. set up the Women's Suffrage Society and mm. many, 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 many years later he's got mm. a vote and eventually you know, labour market equality, it's been a long road and mm. it's not, we're not at the end of it yet. But the impossible, ludicrous, mm. mythical idea of gender mm. equality mm. was pursued by certain people using the state mm. as an enterprise association to get there. Now, assume for the sake of argument we're, we've gotten a long way down that road in this part of the world. Mm. That's certainly not true in other parts of the mm. world. So to take that specific example, mm. if, part, if, if, if it's a myth of progress mm. that men and women should have totally equal economic, social and political mm. status, are there not parts of the world where that myth would be very powerful and very useful indeed? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But it might collide with other myths. For example, democracy. Supposing you move from a situation where you have, as was the case in Iraq, a secular tyranny, secular despotism, a modern state, but it was secular, and actually women were more emancipated in uh, Saddam's Iraq than in most other countries in the Middle East. You get rid of that state, that secular state, predominantly secular. People say that he, you know, towards the end of his period in power, he flirted with the fundamentalists. It's true, but it was basically a secular. Didn't have Sharia law, for example. Mm. You had a secular state there and it's broken down, so now you have um, um, a form of democracy in the sense that, I mean, I think it is a form of democracy in the sense that you can't entirely predict outcomes of votes and so forth, but in which the position of women is, I would say, based on what I've heard from people who've written about this and who've talked to me, is significantly worse in many respects than it was before. Now, is democracy always, because most of the people who believe what you say, they say, okay, we'll use the state. They suppose that that would be a democratic state. Supposing the dominant political forces in the country are hostile to gender equality. Supposing the, the maybe not the majority, but, the, but the, the dominant political forces. Now, I guess if you're a real democrat in this kind of Blairite, magical way, you'll say, bring democracy and it'll all come out in the wash. Mm all these horrible prejudices would vanish away. Mm. Well, because people are good in the because, end. Yeah. Because people will, have, the experience of, of being living in a democracy yeah. will be so thrilling, they'll shed their gender hatreds and gender inequalities. It'll be just so exciting that I don't think so. so I'm not saying I'm opposed to democracy. I'm not saying that democracy should never, I'm just saying if you implement democracy, don't expect that the results will accord with liberal values, because they often don't, as Mill knew very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They often don't. They accord with what the strongest political forces in the society want. Let me give you a different example. It's not just applied to Iraq. Um, America. In the US, um, a powerful functioning democracy, admirable in many ways, superior, I think, in some ways to our own. Some uh, issues are taken out of democracy. Now, is that good or bad? Well, I mean, one of the issues that's taken out of democracy has been uh, abortion choice, through the constitutionalization of abortion choice. Is that good or bad? I think it's good. If I were an American, I'm not an American, but if I were an American, I would favor that constitutionalization. Why? Because if it was brought back into democracy, if it was made, then I think the result would be most American states would ban it. You'd have a few states like New York and California which, where it would be legal, so if you could afford to go there, you could, you could do it, but otherwise you wouldn't. There's a tremendous amount of Christian fundamentalist money floating around legislatures and so on. So if you took that away, there would be a significant loss 
of... Um, now, that's an undemocratic position. I think it's a liberal position, but it's undemocratic. So I think uh, um, one of the gains that's been achieved is in that respect, empowerment of women over their own bodies and so on. That could be lost by democracy. So we have a kind of uh, a conflict here, and it's this kind of conflict that I'm constantly trying to bring back. So one of the problems of the issue of the kind of approach that you've, you've suggested, I think is a good approach in many ways, is all of our myths don't work together. The, myth, the myths that we have, if we have a tremendous amount of mythic delight in the spread of democracy, we might be quite surprised at what democracy produces. Hmm. Uh, uh, and not only in places in, in Iraq or Afghanistan, but also in our own country, in, our own, in, in the so-called developed world. More democracy doesn't mean more freedom. It doesn't even mean more equality. It just means more majority rule. Yeah. Yes, the US is a, a legalistic liberalism, not a political court. So I think on that note, on the, the point of the incommensurability of myths, uh, it will be a good chance to uh, open, open things up. Um, are, there, are there mics? Are there, do we have row mics? One there and one and then is there presumably there's a mic up there as well. Hand, hand three at once? Is that two, two at no, once? No, two or three at once because... It's fine. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, hands, please. And if you want to identify yourself, that's great. The gentleman there. Uh, the lady there in pink. And I'll take one more. And the gentleman up there. So, yes. Hi, uh, Malcolm Lavoie. I'm a MSc political theory student. Um, you, you said in the discussion that um, you don't think that economic progress does result in any, any progress of values or, or any, um, any improvement. But, but previously you had said that you fear that um, the absence of economic progress in the coming years will uh, result in a return to sort of the old, mm. the old evils of uh, racial nationalism and that sort of thing. Mm. I was wondering if you could uh, clarify that, please. Sure. Thank you. That's a good question. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Elena. Um, I've read, I think, I hope I read it correctly, um, that you have said protest demonstrations don't really achieve anything. Okay. I'll say something about that here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yes. Thank you. Okay, so economic progress might not help, but economic regress certainly doesn't help. Um, you've apparently said, I don't remember you saying this, but demonstrating is the way it doesn't help at all. And genetic engineering, good or bad? Well, I'm, I'm not one who wants to limit genetic engineering by any legal um, uh, uh, devices, except insofar as they would involve um, cruelty to humans or the abuse of humans or to some of the higher primates among the animals. So I think I don't want to limit it in any way, but I cannot be entirely, I can't share the sort of gung-ho optimism about it that some people have. Let me give you a slightly, in my, one of my earlier, one of my books which came out last year, I mentioned an episode which I think has now been historically established, but which wasn't um, entirely, uh, wasn't really um, uh, known fully about until after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is that at one point in the 30s, Stalin showed an interest in, um, in breeding a new type of soldier. So he wanted a type of soldier that didn't sleep much, didn't eat much, and didn't even have the uh, um, human responses of sympathy that even hardened soldiers in cruel wars have. So, but fortunately, Stalin, although he had these horrible um, fantasies, he wasn't very much of a judge of science. So he hired a former horse breeder from the Tsarist period um, and told him to go away and do this. And this is a true story. He went away and he uh, gathered chimpanzees from various parts of the world, brought them to a large laboratory um, in uh, Georgia where they had, in quotes, they had sex relations with volunteers. Now, amazingly enough, um, nothing came of it. And the, uh, the science was all nonsense, if there was any. Um, a lot of pseudoscience in the Soviet Union around the time, nothing came of it. And the chap who was the former horse breeder was exiled to the Central Asia where he, um, I think, fell off in front of a train and probably really did fall off in front of a train. Um, now, why do I mention this story? Well, genetic engineering is like anything else in science. It can be used to eradicate um, uh, hereditary diseases, and that would be good. 
Um, but it has certain dangers. One is, in the extreme case I've mentioned, that of uh, if we ever get to that point, I'm not a genetic scientist, so I don't know how close or distant it will be, but it is uh, now, but we, uh, we could clone human beings, develop human beings as slaves, the, the um, Aldous Huxley Society, Brave New World, or as soldiers. To, to, it all depends on the goals you set. And even, I must say, even in much less extreme examples, um, will we have in the selection of new generations the kind of swings of fashion we have in clothing and elsewhere. It sounds absurd, but I mean, supposing people say, well, we don't like these tall people, let's have small ones. We don't like fat people, we want thin people. We don't like people who smile a lot, uh, let's, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, will our contemporary ideals of the good life, living until you're 90, being thin all the time, looking young all the time, never looking old, uh, will, will, will we then be able to sort of construct and design human beings for that purpose. So I have, I have doubts about it, but there's no solution. In other words, uh, um, we can be wiser, we can expect abuses, we can, be, we can keep our eyes open for dangerous tendencies, but there's no solution because this is just knowledge and the power that goes with knowledge. So if we have another Hitler, if we have, then this knowledge will be used for purposes, again, for example, like genetically selective weapons. That's something I think which is probably not that far away now, genetically selective weapons, which kill principally people belonging into certain um, genetic uh, categories. So what we need here is not sort of despair or wild enthusiasm, but I think a kind of a balanced approach, which sees that knowledge nearly always, or always, has these ethically and politically ambiguous dimensions. But if we could isolate a gene for virtue, it would be okay, wouldn't we? Because then you could genetically engineer it, then you could have moral progress. Not well. Gene for well, <laughs> I could do that. It's a very good spoof because there would be people who would say, yes, let's do that. Yeah. In fact, there were people, let me give you an example. Um, Arthur Kerstler, very interesting writer, ex communist, a very good writer in many ways, towards the end of his life said, what we, you know, humans are very aggressive. Mm. He'd noticed that. Um, uh, he said, what we could do is, you know, what we could do is, develop some kind of physical treatment which would remove their aggression. Now, if you think about that for five minutes or five seconds, no more protest demonstrations, for one thing, because they're aggressive, aren't they? People coming out and sort of threatening policemen and other, other types of things, threatening to beat them up. Uh, um, so if you took the aggression out of them, you see, the key thing is what counts as virtue? That's one thing. And secondly, who decides what's virtuous? And secondly, there's another perhaps more profound error in this, in this kind of idea of constructing an ideal person, which is that it's the idea that if you really could decide on a virtue and you could implement that through some sort of physical treatment or engineering or, or whatever, that you wouldn't lose anything. But you see, one of the views that I take is that often virtues are tied up with things that are not virtuous. The kind of healthy aggression of resisting arbitrary power or going along to a, a slightly um, potentially um, uh, unpleasant mass demonstration is connected with the human capacity for violence, which in other contexts can be absolutely awful. But there's no way actually of, of ironing it out. There's no way if we say, well, we'll take all the violence out. Well, what that would mean is whoever took it out would have unlimited power because no one could resist it. They'd all be tranquilized like the people in, in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. So it's a, very good, it's a very good example of that. You know, if we know what virtue is, why don't we just engineer it. engineer it, either put a virtue gene in if there isn't one mm. in human, or take all the vice gene. Well, what will be vice? In, the, in fact, people who say, talk about, if you read late 19th century, up to really the Second World War, you get talk about the criminal personality. There's such a thing as the criminal personality. There's even something called craniometry. I'm not making this up whereby uh, uh, right up to the Second World War, if you had the misfortune to go to a court in Britain, but also other European countries, where they believed in craniometry, they test, they measured various parts of your brain to look for the criminal, criminal sort of uh, dimensions, etc. Now, it's all complete nonsense for a variety of reasons, but one reason is that one count, what counts as crime changes, sometimes for good reasons, over time. So when it was criminal to be gay, 
they would find all these, as it were, poor old Oscar Wilde would say, my God, this sort of craniometrically, he's a terrible mess, <laughs> if, if, if it was true, and he could be bunged off. So it depends on, in a sense, moral learning. It depends on how clear a, grip, a grasp you have on underlying moral, moral reality. If it's the case, as it's always the case, that the powers that be are confused, incoherent, occasionally right, but very often incoherent and stupid and bigoted and populist and so on, then what they would implement would be that. Imagine the governments that we have in the world now, but with the power to implant virtue genes, mm. kind of genetic asbos. You just stick it in there and you've got the person for the rest of their lives. I think that's a recipe for hell. Ben Smith said, don't knock Asbos. They're the only qualifications some of these kids are going to get. Um, I, I actually thought that a years-long program to try and manage aggression out of people was called having kids. But um, <laughs> certainly my experience. Anyway, you haven't asked this question, though. Pro there's oh. Protests don't work anyway. Well, don't well I mean, no, I'm not don't saying work. don't go on protest, but they haven't worked, have they? Let me, give you an Let me give you an example. So it's a fact, empirical fact they don't work. Well, recently they haven't. I mean, what about the Iraq protest? Was that not the biggest in British history? Was it not cross-party? Did it not involve people of all kinds of different... Was it not associated with the largest parliamentary rebellion, even, in recent times? But didn't we then re-elect the party that had... Yes. That? <laughs> so, I mean, my point is not that we should, we should give up, but don't expect too much from that. You can have consistent, active... And one of the problems of modern politics is that decisions of war and peace are taken by, in Britain, one person. Mm. One person. Now, you could change that. You could have a legislative requirement. Well, Brown says he's going to, doesn't he? Uh, well, Brown says he's going to. It hasn't happened, as far as I know. You could change it whereby there'd have to be a vote in Parliament. That would be somewhat better. You could, you could, you could say it had to be two-thirds, or you could say... You could, there are various things you could do, but at the moment, in many parts of the world... Let's take a different example. Let's go back just quickly to Iraq. In the United States, who supported the Iraq war? It was not the State Department. It was not the military Pentagon. The film The Loop if you want to look at that, is, as far as I know, correct in portraying strong military resistance to the war, up to the point at which it was not any of the main organs of American government. It was a few people in the White House. So you can, you can demonstrate as much as you like. You can even have the majority opinion in all the major institutions of the country. And still, a major decision like going to war can happen. So I think that's a... It's kind of an example. It's not only protest demonstrations that can't stop that. Okay. Even the leading institutions in the country have weren't able to stop it. All right. You haven't. Uh, I want to go back, out again, but I know you haven't answered the first one. So very briefly, this question: uh, economic progress might not bring moral progress, oh, that's, but, yeah. but economic no, no. regress. It's an important question. You've argued like, economic regress. Yeah. I don't think there's a contradiction there, but I'm grateful for your question because it allows me to um, to elucidate it. What I meant by it is that I don't think economic advance ever removes or even significantly or irreversibly diminishes the human propensities to these horrible behaviors. They can sort of mask them or neutralize them for a while. But in a sense, my argument is consistent, I think, with what you're saying. Because what I'm saying is when that um, process of economic tranquilization is withdrawn, these uh, human responses emerge. Now, you could say, well, that's consistent with the view. I think I mentioned this early on. If we could, get, if we could keep the economic growth going forever and not slowing down, if there were no crises, if there were no booms and busts, then we'd have, we could get rid of all these behaviours. But precisely because humans are what they are, that can't be done. What do I mean by that? I mean leaders, uh, thinkers, political leaders, even heads of central banks, will become intoxicated by the folly of um, rapid, incessant growth and all the profits that come from that. So they will engage in the kind of absurdist policies that we've had in the world economy or parts of it in the last 10, 15, 20 years. That will then lead to a breakdown, as is now happening. And in parts of the world, the response will be these classical evils. So you might be right in the sense that if we could unendingly, if we could engineer an unending growth, then in some respects, some respects, 
certain types of um, nasty behavior will be reduced. But as I also said earlier, I'm not completely convinced either that poor people are more prone. I'm not, I mean, it's an Eskimo community, or Inuit, as they're now called, is an, because they were destitute, had almost no wealth, or a pygmy community, or pre-invasion Tibet, because they were very poor, were they more intolerant, more persecutory, more cruel, more savage? I don't think so. Okay. Another round. Uh, gentleman there, the lady there, and the gentleman up there. Thanks. Um, I wondered whether and, and, and or how you distinguished your suspicion of progress. Can from you hear him? Is that working? I can hear, but I don't okay. know about the can, can, you, other... can you hear him? Okay. I wondered whether, and, and if so, how you distinguished your suspicion of progress from that which I suppose characterises quite a dominant train in 20th century thought in Europe, at least, um, of the sort that I guess came out of Freud and Nietzsche and Marx and has been quite dominant in, in the academy, if not outside the academy, for mm. the last 30 years. H how would you locate yourself in that tradition? Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, sorry. Yes. Sorry, yeah. um, I'd like to ask, uh, you, you made this comparison with uh, science. With? With science. 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 Oh, science. Science, yeah. sorry. So, science and how um, poli policy and ethics is different. Yeah. And I was just wondering, because science is a system that bypasses human nature, really. It's like a set of rules that, although scientists can be good at it or they can you know, get attached to their pet theories and things like that, they do not get into the system. At the end of the day, you have clear knowledge. I wonder whether you would think that progress can be defined as, at some point, getting a set I don't know, rules for, or um, an idea of how we could have a system that would bypass the mm. human nature, we cannot change it, but perhaps we can have a political system that mm. safeguards. And whether affluence could be a step towards that, exactly because it neutralizes. So it would give us the space to realize these things. And would you, my question basically is, would you, Describe that that progress and whether that would be, you know, viable. Mm. Mm. That's a great question. Okay. Mm. And uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's no microphone, so it's all right. We, we can hear you uh, shout. We can hear. Population increase and environmental collapse. I'm just be interested to know how you think the next 90 years. <laughs> next 90 years. 90. Okay. No so, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I once worked with someone who used to give, uh, tell companies they needed 500-year plans, so 90 is quite uh, and yes, short you've term. Got the other questions. Exactly, too short term. Um, differentiating yourself from other sceptics of uh, progress in the 20th century isn't bypassing human nature progress in a 90-year plan. Mm. If you do it reasonably swiftly, John, I can get another round. Okay, I'll try to be very quick. Um, 90 years and 90 seconds. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not sure Freud is the same as Nietzsche in this respect. I mean, they were made, I mean, Freud did believe in progress, but he thought it was extremely fragile and could be undone. I mean, he wanted progress. Um, I think if you're interested in Freud, one of the most fascinating documents are letters he exchanged with Einstein in the run-up to the Second World War, where Einstein thought that knowledge and education and so on could eliminate, eliminate war. Einstein said, no can't eliminate, won't eliminate war, war is too complicated, intractable, it has other sources, but nonetheless, uh, I mean, I would be, in that sense, closer to Freud, although um, I'm not even convinced that the kind of modest progress that he um, fought for, I'm convinced it's real and has been achieved in certain respects, I'm not convinced it can last, but I think I'd be closer to, to, to Freud than to the other thing, as you mentioned. Science and human nature is a very interesting example. Isn't science a way of bypassing human nature? It's a wonderful idea. Um, 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 I don't think so, unfortunately, because, you see, on the one hand, it's true that in science we have, a, we have this fact of growing knowledge, and I view that as a fact. I know people don't like talking about facts now. They say all facts are interpretation, but I think that is a fact. Um, on the other hand, of course, we have the ubiquitous phenomenon of pseudoscience, not just in the 1930s, the Zenko and Nazi science. Don't, don't forget, they claimed racism was scientific. They claimed that, and they actually drew on thinkers like Galton in England, 19th century anthropologists, who did claim that racial, uh, the difference between so-called races were grounded in science. And I think pseudoscience, I think the, at any one time of, in the development of science, 
science is inevitably caught up in the confusion, the folly, the power conflict of the time. And I mean, I think actually, I mean, there probably are economists here who might disagree with this, but a lot of economics has been pseudoscience. Quite a lot of economics has been actually pseudoscience. Not the greatest economics. I'll give you a quote. I was just reading um, Maynard Keynes, a very, very, very great economist, as well as a very great thinker and cultivated human being. And at the end of a long, remember, he wrote a book on probability, a treatise on probability. He's one of the modern uh, thinkers who um, attempted to have a theory of probability. And at the end of it, he actually, at one point he says, he says, well, can we really think about the probability of the future price of copper or new inventions or, or uh, new industries? He said, no. He said, we simply don't know. Now, that would be something useful if it had been remembered by the people who set up long-term capital management if they'd, re if they'd remembered that actually these probabilities of fundamentally important events can't actually be assigned, that were in uncertainty, not risk, it would be jolly useful, but they didn't. So I, I can't think that there's any... Science is a powerful institution, and it is an institution, and that's an important point, and therefore it's to some extent bypasses in some contexts and for some time the worst fe some of the worst features of human nature, but as a way of getting around it, I don't think so, nor do I think um, one can get around the human propensity to mutual cruelty by universal affluence, if only because, there are other reasons too which I've already mentioned, but if only because you can't sustain universal affluence forever, because wars will disrupt it. Um, uh, sudden revolutionary collapses will disrupt it. It's a bit like, let me give you one quick and then I'll finish, it's a bit like I've met people that, some who believe that um, if they have themselves frozen or if they can't afford the entire cat of a frozen, the brain, the, 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 the credit crunch version, just have the brain frozen. Economy freezing. Economy freezing. They think, they say, they, if we can have myself frozen, I'll come back and the technology will have developed and at that period uh, I can be brought back. That's where I can be revived now. What I say to this is say, look, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, I don't know whether this is possible or not. I have no idea. Maybe knowledge will grow fast enough to make it possible in 100 or 200 or 300 years. But what I do know is that in those two or 300 years, property rights will have changed, companies will have gone broke, whole regimes will have vanished, there will have probably been world wars, there will have been massive revolutions, companies that you, you have yourself stored somewhere in the Nevada desert with a company which is in Las Vegas somewhere. I sincerely doubt that will be there 300 years from now. So, in other words, what they're missing out is the intractable contingencies of history. History will intervene, and even if um, the technology develops, their casket, their firm, will have long vanished, and they will, in fact, be mortal, like the rest of us. That was quite a good summary of the next 90 years as well, but if you would it might sp uh, you haven't really done the environment yet, and I think just... If you I should say something... Minutes, uh, minutes yeah. on where you think, because you're quite love on the environment. Well, I am. Um, I think the first thing to say is that um, we, can't, we can't know for certain how far down the road we are to irreversible climate change. I'm not a scientist again, so I rely on the scientific consensus. But speaking as someone who studied the theory and philosophy of science, there are two reasons why we can't um, know how far down the road we are. One is our knowledge is fallible, including the models. A lot of the models are actually dated by the time they get out nowadays. That's kind of one. Another reason is the climate may be more chaotic than we think. I mean, there is, we've discovered there is such a thing in nature as chaos. So there may be periods, as we actually we're in one now, in which global temperatures have fallen. We're in a dip. How long will this go on? It's unknowable. So all we can do, it seems to me, is adopt policies which will enable us to cope with all but the worst outcomes moderately well. Now, what would such policies be? Uh, because I'm often criticised for not suggesting. Well, I'll give you an example. I go to Holland, the Netherlands, quite a bit. And in the Netherlands, they've had long experience of rising sea level. And what they're doing there is they're giving some land back to the sea, they're building more on stilts. They're giving land which used to be um, uh, farmland uh, back to wildlife. They're creating wildlife pathways so that the wildlife can move about. And they're doing that because they think that the balance of scientific evidence at the moment 
suggests over time, over the next few decades and generations, rising sea levels. Now, I, think, I find that pragmatic, sober, but also rather inspiring. They're doing their best, it actually helps other species as well as us, um, to react in that. So there are some, but I mean, that involves something which some of my green friends are adamantly opposed to. They say, you mean we can't stop global warming? So I say, you mean send the planet an ultimatum? No more of this global warming. Mm. It's extremely threatening to human dignity. We want that immediately stopped. We could kind of bomb the planet in submission, I suppose. We could have drones kind of going into particular hot areas and scorching it. Um, and some of the geoengineering schemes that we now hear are actually rather like that. Um, uh, creating vast clouds to cool down the Earth. Well, you know, these things may happen. They may even be... Uh, Something like that, if we move into radical climate change, could really happen, but it's, it's very dangerous business because we don't really understand what we're doing. So the only thing, um, I do think that with um, resource problems, potential and actual resource wars, um, the destruction of biosphere, as important, by the way, the destruction of biosphere in Sumatra or Brazil or other parts of the world is as important, if not more important, than carbon emissions. Because if you wipe these natural mechanisms out, and even if we reduced carbon emissions by half, get rid of all of these, you're back where you started. Um, so it's a very, very serious problem. And we can't, just because we humans this time around triggered this global warming, we can't now, by action, stop it in its tracks, because it's, it's in the works. And the planet, as I say, the planet is not a seminar. The planet is a huge, active, complex system which is now trying to move to some different equilibrium. And our response as human beings should, I think, try to actually um, intelligently organize ourselves so that that happens without too much sorrow and anguish for us human beings and other living things. Okay, so let's do another quick round of uh, Yes, the, the gentleman there. Okay. okay. Shall I be the last? Yeah. Well, these are, these are all very good questions. Very good. And they're rather profound, so my answers will be the shortest answers I've given so far. Um, wouldn't a world in which we are all fully aware of our incommensurable myths and incommensurable values be better or more liberal than a world in which we're not? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, would a world without religions be better than a world with religions? I've criticized what I call evangelical atheists who are absolutely certain, indeed adamant, that a world without religions would be better than a world with religions. I don't know. Partly because it's unimaginable. Partly because I think none of us can know whether we are ourselves free of myths. I'm not sure that I am. I'm not sure, we, we never know. Our thought really emerges. Our conscious, critical, rational thought is always partly shaped by forces we're not fully aware of. And we can get glimpses in them, which is why Freud was a great man, a great thinker. But, uh, but he had myths. I mean, he had the myth of Eros and Thanatos, love and death, lots of myths. So I don't think we can do that. I think practically speaking, I'm more inclined to um, try and humanize or temper myths than to get into a situation which is impossible or even mythical of not having myths. Is the Enlightenment sort of, aren't, aren't there good things about the Enlightenment? Yeah, plenty of good things about the Enlightenment. But the Enlightenment is not just one thing, of course. The Enlightenment is many different types of um, thinkers over periods of time. So the Enlightenment includes um, Spinoza, Locke, um, Mill, um, Marx, Lenin, the Jacobins, even some of the 19th century racists from whom the Nazis took inspiration saw themselves as continuing an Enlightenment tradition. They said, we're going to have a, a science of race. It's not going to be based on mere prejudice from now on. It's going to be based on knowledge. So if we kill people, we know why they're killing them. Mm -hmm. um, Engels, for example, a rather good new book about on, uh, come out recently uh, on Engels, um, says uh, there he's in favor of what he calls non-historical peoples fading away or being encouraged to fade away. With very common attitudes like that in the 19th century on the progressive left as well as 
um, as well as the right. So my answer is yes, there's plenty of good things about the Enlightenment. What I suppose really um, uh, uh, annoys me or what I criticize is the idea that the Enlightenment was entirely benign and we can solve all of our problems by going back to it. What if the Enlightenment included Lenin, included the Jacobins, included even some of the Nazis? I don't see that it's a simple solution. It's really actually a type of moral panic. It's the idea that, well, we really need something strong to go back to. Let's go back to this mythical thing called the Enlightenment. It's very like religious fundamentalism. Let's get away from all this confusion about what the Bible really means. and Let's really just decide and go back to it and stick to it. Then we'll be all right. You won't be. You'll have a kind of combination of adamant certainty with complete confusion, which is a very common contemporary condition. Um, is my, are my views falsifiable? Good question, because I do, I'm not a Popperian, but I do admire certain aspects of Popper's thought. Uh, perhaps he didn't always implement it himself, but then none of us does. But um, um, I do think there is a responsibility on people, including myself, who say things about the world to be ready to specify falsify falsification conditions. In other words, uh, if you would say, what would change your view of the Iraq war? Say, well, if when the surge is over and the Americans really leave, either because they've decided to leave, think their work is done, or because they're broke, um, if, the then is, if the state of Iraq continues to exist, if there isn't a continuation of ethnic cleansing, and these are measurable things, they're objective things, um, if the position of majorities, women, the Shias, out of minorities, doesn't continue to be worse than it was before, but improves. I said, okay, bitter as it is to me to say so, Tony Blair was right. <laughs> His deep, profound, clairvoyant insight into human history was much greater than, than anything I could muster. He was right. If that happens, I will, I will say something like that. And in one sense, because I wish it would happen, because I wish all this sorrow was not for nothing. But equally, if, we, if it comes to the future, I'm not prepared to support wars on the off chance that something like that will happen. I'm not prepared to say, well, we'll go in, we'll sort of, you know, we'll sort it all out, it'll only last a few weeks. It never lasts only a few weeks. There are always vast collateral damages to lives, millions of, of, of refugees, damage ruined uh, uh, or, or greatly impaired lives apart from those who killed. I'm still, even if at the end of the day I had to admit that, and I would be willing to admit it in the case of Iraq, I still wouldn't support wars in future on that basis because it's too risky. It's, it involves too much of a gamble, even if it sometimes turns out right. Supposing we had 10 wars like that and one of them turned out okay. Is that really a sensible way of, of going on? Um, I don't think so. It's better to be more modest. It's better to admit what we can't achieve. It's better to admit uh, that we can't always um, uh, um, uh, rid the world of tyranny and make it thereby better. Because sometimes anarchy or breakdown or terrible war, protracted many-sided civil wars, are even worse than tyranny. So I hope, I mean, I haven't answered the question about the next 90 years. And I won't attempt to answer. I mean, I'd probably end up as, 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 as wrong as, as Mill. But if you ask me at the present what I think the big story is for the next 90 years, then what I would say is, on the basis of the scientific consensus as a non-scientist that I understand, the big story will be climate change. So unless the science is all wrong, which I don't believe for a single moment. I don't believe environmental skeptics who say this. They're usually just dogmatists and deniers. Mm -hmm. Unless that's all wrong, the big story, the big story is climate change. And there what we need, I think, is flexibility, pragmatism, sobriety, technical virtuosity, and not imagining that there's some silver bullet that can, that can solve this, or blaming it all on some human group. Because one of the things we absolutely do know from history for certain, I don't think this will sadly ever be falsified, is that blaming deep intractable problems on particular human groups is always disastrous. Well, if, I, if I speak for anybody else in the room, um, that's been a hugely enjoyable evening, and uh, I have learned a great deal. Um, 
Uh, as I hope have you, you should of course be aware that if you subscribe to John's view, the fact that you've learnt a great deal in no way makes you better people <laughs> as you walk out of this room, but I cannot think of a better way for us to have spent our evening. Uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking Professor John Gray.